So the second step now. So what really is Ezekiel 28 about? That's the second question. These are actually questions I asked Elohim, right? And why the reference to the anointed cherub? So if it's not Satan, we've established that with beyond a doubt. Let me know in the comments if you see what the scripture has said. Type one. Yes, if you understand and agree. Two, if you don't agree. What the scripture has said, what we've gone through in the scriptures. The second step. So what really is Ezekiel 28 about? And why the reference to the anointed cherub? And to answer this, we need to examine two things. And these two things is not by my mind. Elohim downloads the generation of the Tyrian kings. Go study that. Ezekiel's writing as a prophet. Go study that. Right. So you can type in the comments in the meantime. So now what we're going to do now, we're going to go through lots of scriptures really quickly. And it will be excerpts from scriptures because it's, I would love to read all, but it's impossible. The slides are there. You can always go through the slides again. So the generation of the Tyrian kings. And it, I was surprised to learn this, of course, because I never knew this before, you know. But I was surprised to learn that David had an alliance with the king of Tyre. And we're going to look at 2 Samuel really quickly. And we're going to try to study now. So what is Ezekiel 28 about? Remember now, we are not interested in just what we've always heard. We are interested in what is in scripture. Everything is in Elohim's word. His truth is in his word. Remember how we started. We started with a scripture that said from 3 John 1 to 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Elohim doesn't. Hallelujah. Still further says he's still forming his opinion. Of course, that's understandable because this is a shock. It was a shock to me because I too believed it. But yet when I look at scripture, all I would say is when you through, pray about it and look at scripture. When you look at scripture, you actually can see, but yes, this it's not Satan because the scripture says X, Y, Z. You go through the scripture and you see and understand it. So take your time. So no greater joy than my children to walk in truth. So let's see what the scripture says. And we're dealing with right now the generation of the Tyrian kings. I'm looking over here because my screen is too small. And we're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 5. If anybody else have seen it, you can type in the, ch the chat whether you've seen it according to scripture, at least the first part that the anointed cherub is not Satan. The end of the anointed cherub is not the same end that Satan gets, that it is completely different according to scripture. So now, 2 Samuel chapter 5. So let's look at this. We need to understand. So Ezekiel 28, the prince of Tyre, the king of Tyre. So what is the generation? What is going on here? So in Ezekiel, in 2 Samuel 5, it says, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was over us, thou was he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And Yahuwah said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. I want you to understand something as we're going through the scriptures here now. I won't stop too much. As, and I'm saying this for myself, because this is an, a revelation that has become afresh to me over the last couple months doing deep Bible study, that the scriptures, in the scriptures, we see a Yahuwah, let me tell you, where Yahuwah has chosen to put his name, Israel, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, is a serious thing for Yahuwah. We perhaps might never comprehend it. The prophets comprehended it. And we are getting there because we were not made to understand that when we came into the faith, right? We were not made to recognize that to the fullness that we ought to. That's number one. The second thing is, as I'm going to go through this, I want to lay these two foundations down so that you read the scriptures with that at the back of your mind. When it comes to the children of Israel, even if they had sinned, Yahuwah, has a covenant with the children of Israel. Now, he knows the descendants today. Some can tell, some don't know. Those that are Gentiles and that are grafted in, where are they grafted into? They are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. They are grafted in. Israel is still important to Yahuwah. 
And that is why we see many even future prophecies in the Bible when he shall gather those that are scattered. But even Israel who are Israel by blood, by descendant, they still have to accept Yahusha. And that was the problem Paal, Paul had in the beginning because Paul, Paul was zealous for Elohim and that's what a lot of people forget. Paul wasn't like someone who was breaking law. Paul was zealous. Was he a Benjamite, I think? Was zealous for Elohim. So Paul had to come to the revelation that being at a descendant of Israel, being a child of Israel, right? He had to accept Yahusha and that Yahusha came for their deliverance. He was the prophet that was promised. He was the son of Elohim, more than a prophet, I say, the son of Elohim that was promised. So even when Yahuwah gathers all that are scattered, those that are descendants, those that are grafted in, those that are alive at that time, scattered. We're not talking about those that rise in the resurrection when Yahusha returns, because there's the rising and there's the gathering. That's for another debate, another um video. But even when he gathers those that are scattered, it's important to understand that there will be rebels among them. And the scripture talks about a sifting out of the rebels. You have to accept Yahusha, Hamashiach, as your Adonai and Savior. So I want you to understand at the back of your mind, everything in scripture, Yahuwah is very, very concerned about his people, Israel. So with that, let us read about the nation of Israel when Yahuwah chose David to rule over Israel, right? So all the elders of Israel now came to the king to Hebron and King David made a league with them in Hebron before, the, before Yahuwah and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months and in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. So they came together. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem onto the Jebusites. It's important to understand the Jebusites had occupied Mount Zion. All right? But we're not going to go into all that. We remain in focus because we're focusing on Ezekiel 28. But all this is necessary. So the, the inhabitants of the land which spake unto David saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in thither. Thinking David cannot come in hither. So, in other words, you know, they're using the blind and the lame as a front to protect them, right? You know, as a strategy of war, they would put the, because the blind and the lame there, you'll not kill the blind and the lame, so they will not come in and get them. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And David said on that day, whosoever goeth, getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. So of course they conquered Zion, which is the city of David, where the Jebusites had occupied. Now, and David went on and grew great. And Adonai Yahuwah of hosts was with him. Remember. Israel is important to Yahuwah. The enemy has succeeded in shifting people's eyes to think, well, those that are there now, these are the true Israel. He has succeeded in making that shift. But there is another prophecy that these people are fulfilling. And that we covered in the 1948 Deception and Lies video. And David went on, okay, and Hiram, now here it is, we're stopping on 12. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and see the trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David an house. And David perceived that the Elo that Elohim, Yahuwah, had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. So this is the first case here where we've seen that the king of Tyre, David had an alliance with the king of Tyre. And the king of Tyre sent messengers to David. So see the trees and carpenters and masons, all that David needed to build his house. Now this continues the deep search. Then later in scripture, you discover that Solomon, his son, whom Yahuwah had promised to put a seed on his throne. 
Solomon, his son now, is on the throne of David. And Solomon, his son, also has an alliance with the king of Tyre. But saints, oops, the alliance that Solomon has now with the king of Tyre, it goes even deeper than the alliance that David had with the king of Tyre. So let us look at this now. We're going deep. So I want you to, first of all, before I talk about that alliance that Solomon had, while I'm saying this, I'm going to get the scripture up in 1 Kings. I want you and I to think about, right now in this world, we can see um, Elohim say call no man fool. So I'll not call anybody fool. But it's only Elohim can call a man fool. But we can see the, can't find the word, dumbest, dumbest people that running, making some of the laws and you wonder, but how could they make such laws? How could they do such things? Where do they come up with this? Where are the educated people? You know, what's going on, right? So, but we, there is no one upon this earth that can equal to the wisdom that Solomon was endowed with. So I wanted to imagine that Solomon is among us right now. And if Solomon is among us right now, all the kings of the world would want to be in alliance with Solomon. And if any king that has a favorable alliance with Solomon, huh, that king in the eyes of Yahuwah will receive a special favor or blessing. Do you agree? Yes or no? Because we've established what Israel, the children of Israel, and the land of Israel means to Yahuwah. Forget what the children of Israel do. Forget what anybody else say. Forget what even we ourselves have heard. We're focusing on the scripture, what that means to Yahuwah. So Solomon is endowed with wisdom. And we're looking now at 1 Kings chapter 4. And again, we're only going to read excerpts. You can always read the entire chapters on your own when you have time. So let's look at this. 29 to 34. And Elohim gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men, the, than Ethan the Ezrahite, and Heman and Calcol. And I'm guessing they're citing these people because these must have been people in that time who were really, really famous and wise in the eyes of other men. And Dada, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowls and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. So it's important to understand who Solomon is. In now going to dive deep into what is this alliance between Tyre and Solomon, this alliance that was there with David and now is passed on to Solomon. Solomon now is the wisest of all on the earth. And there came people from, from wronged about all the kings of the earth, the scripture says, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So now what we're going to do is, we're going to go into the next chapter. We're going to go into 1 Kings chapter 5. And we're going to see the king of Tyre, what he thinks about this. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that he had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. So this confirms what we have been saying all along, that for Hiram to have that alliance with David in the eyes of Yahuwah, saying, I hope you've seen this. I hope you're understanding that once you love Israel, you're in favor with Elohim. Once you hate Israel, I'm not talking about the people who are fulfilling prophecy, the Gentiles, Jerusalem being trodden down by the Gentiles. We're talking about scripture now in scripture. Once you hate Israel, you're in trouble with Yahuwah, right? So Hiram, the king of Tyre, had an alliance with David. It says he was a lover of David. He loved him. He loved him, whether it's as a brother. You know, you know when you love somebody as a brother and you care for them and you, you know, whatever they need, whatever help you need, you can count on me, you can rely on me. How oh, we ought to love one another in Mashiach. 
hallelujah, and care for one another in Mashiach. So Hiram now, and Solomon sent to Hiram saying, thou knowest how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of Yahuwah, Adonai Yahuwah, for the wars which were about him on every side, until Yahuwah put them under the soles of his feet. But now Adonai Yahuwah have given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. We know this, Solomon had peace. And behold, I purpose to build a house unto the name of Adonai Yahuwah, as Adonai spoke unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build a house unto my name. Now, I really hope you all seen how serious this is. I really hope that you are understanding to build a house for Yahuwah is a serious, serious thing. Silfreda says, Yasharel to me is the people or remnant. Hallelujah. 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 That's right. So Yasharel, they're the descendants of Yasharel because they are scattered. And they are those that are grafted in. Once we come in, we come into the commonwealth of Israel. And there will be a remnant at that time. There will be a remnant because your Elohim says so. At the time of Yahushua return, in terms of those alive, those that are asleep, those in Mashiach asleep will rise. But those that are alive on the earth will be the remnant that are scattered that he will gather. So, again, we're doing, we, we, we're doing everything by what scripture says. And it says here, where was I in what verse? Right. So, Solomon is sending to Hiram to tell him that Elohim has chosen him to build a house for him. Now, therefore, command that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servant shall be with thy servants. This speaks to an alliance. And unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that, any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. So the Sidonians were the best in that kind of work. And it came to pass, pay attention to these words. When Hiram heard the words of Solomon, that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be Adonai, Yahuwah, this day, which have given unto David a wise son over this great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sentest to me for, and I will do all thy desire concerning timber of cedar and concerning timber of fur. So all wood for the temple saints, every single piece of wood, Hiram from Tyre is consenting to provide for Solomon. So we drink of water. And he says, my servant shall bring them down from Lebanon, but not only wood also, unto the sea. And I will convey them by sea in float unto the place that thou shalt appoint me and will cause them to be discharged there and thou shalt receive them and thou shalt accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. So the alliance is, if Solomon, he would provide all that Solomon's need, need for the building of Elohim's temple. This is not just the Catholic church building a temple around the corner or the Baptist church just put up a temple around this corner. This is Elohim's temple. Now, and Solomon in exchange would provide food for his house. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household and 20 measures of pure oil. Thus Solomon gave to Hiram year by year because remember it was a number of years. I can't remember if it was 20 years when he finished everything, but it's a number of years that he was in the building of the temple and the building of his house. And Hiram, king of Tyre, provided all that they need. And throughout that time, year by year, Solomon will provide the food and the oil and all that he needs. And King Solomon raised the levy out of all Israel. And the levy was 30,000 men. And he sent them to Lebanon, Lebanon, which is Sidon, 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 Sidon right? And 10,000 a month by courses. A month they were in Lebanon and two months at home. And Adoniram was over the levy. And Solomon had three score and 10,000 that bear burdens and four score thousand hewers in the mountains, beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, 3,300, which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. This was a big work, a big work. I mean, just the four man, 3,300, which ruled over the people that wrought the work. That's the four man. You know, when you have the supervisors on construction, that was a big work. 
And the king commanded and they brought great stones, costly stones and huge stones to lay the foundation of the house. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders did hew them and the stone squarers, so they prepared timber and stones to build the house. This is not a light thing. So we see here in this chapter that Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that he was anointed king in his place of his father and that Hiram always loved David and to remember David was a man after Elohim's heart. And when you read in 1 Samuel chapter 5, chapter 13, we read in one verse, it says, I'll read it aloud, 1 Samuel 13 verse 4, it says, and all Israel heard, I think I have the wrong chapter here, verse 14, right, verse 14, sorry, 1 Samuel 13 verse 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue, the Adonai have sought him a man after his own heart, and Yahuwah have commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which Elohim commanded thee. So we know for a fact that Elohim chose David, who was a man after Yahuwah's own heart. This is not a light thing, right? We know for a fact also in Acts 13, 22, you can write this down and check it all yourself afterwards. It says, and when he had removed him, he raised him, raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So this is not a light thing. When somebody, Yahuwah is saying, this is a man after my own heart. We have to try to put ourselves in the frame of the scriptures and understanding. We cannot understand Yahuwah. But Yahuwah reveals and gives us a measure of understanding so that we can see how things are important and matter to Yahuwah. And that is the understanding the prophets had, why more than us, even more, why they are the prophets. Then we see here, Solomon asks Hiram to command men to hew see the trees out of Lemadon. His servants will join Solomon's servants. Solomon will pay whatever wages he desire, for no one among them could equal the skill of the Sidon men in cutting timber. And when Hiram heard these words, it all comes together in the end. When Hiram heard these words of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be Yahuwah this day, who has given David a wise son to be over this great people. He glorified the king of Tyre. He glorified Yahuwah. Hiram and Solomon formed an alliance. Solomon would provide whatever he needed. And Hiram would provide whatever Solomon needed for the temple. And of course, Solomon paid these yearly. He gave them to Hiram yearly. Yahuwah gave Solomon wisdom as he promised. There was peace between Hiram and Solomon, Solomon, and they made a treaty. Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the men of Gebal did the hewing and prepared the timber and stones to build the house of Elohim, even laid a foundation. Now we're going to read one other chapter here on the alliance that Solomon has with the king of Tyre. You see, because the thing about it, we cannot be tired of Elohim's word. If you want truth, you have to be willing to go and dig. We have to be willing to study the scriptures because it's only there it's found. His word is truth. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim. Now, I won't read the whole um, chapter. It has 38 verses, but I will encourage you to read it. You know why? This is going to give you a deep, deep understanding of how much this matters to Elohim. And this can we can mirror this with Moses in the time of Exodus and the building of the temple. We can mirror this. And then you will be able to have the required understanding of what is taking place and what this alliance means in the eyes of Elohim. Not in our eyes of flesh, in the eyes of spirit, we have to look through this. So I'm going to skip through. And you see I have verses here because I'm just going to call and pick on some verses. And of course, I invite you because it has a lot more than I would just cite here. So you can see that the depth of that alliance, right? So he built the walls of the house, the holy plan and the holy of holies within boards of cedar from the floor of the house to the rafters of the ceiling. So we're only going to look at 1 Kings 6. We're only going to look at verse 15. Let's get that up. So I'm going through. He built much more, like I said, but you'd have to go through that. I would love to go through everything, but it would be impossible. We'll be here till nine in the morning. 
So, and I don't want to keep you that long. I thank you so much for already sticking with me till this time. So verse 15, and he built the walls of the house within the boards of cedar, both the floor of the house and the walls of the ceiling, and he covered them on the inside with wood and covered the floor of the house with planks of fur. Now remember who provided all this cedar, who provided all this wood and who helped in the building. Now we're going down to verse, he built 20 cubits on the sides of the house, both the floor and the walls with the boards of cedar, he even built them for it within, even for the oracle, even for the most holy place. Holy, holy place. Ponder on that. Verse 18. And the cedar of the house within was carved with knobs and open flowers. All was cedar. There was no stone seen. So the most holy place. Hiram and his men had a role. Tyre had a role in this. And he prepared the holy of the holies. Let's go down. And the oracle he and the oracle he prepared, sorry, in the house within to set there the ark of the covenant of Elohim. The ark of the covenant was put into this place where it is prepared. We have to see this in the eyes of the Ruach Hakodesh. Now let's go down. Verse 20. And the oracle in the forepart was 20 cubits in length and 20 cubits in breadth and 20 cubits in the height thereof, and overlaid it with pure gold, and so covered the altar, which was of cedar. The altar also was made of cedar, and also the whole house was overlaid with gold. We're continuing. Going down to 23. And within the oracle, he made two cherubims of olive tree, each 10 cubits high, and five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits, the other wing of the cherub, from the uttermost part of the one wing unto the uttermost part of the other were ten cubits, and the other cherub was ten cubits. Both the cherubims were of one measure and of one size. The height of the one cherub was ten cubits, so was it of the other cherub. 27, and we end on 28. And he set the cherubims within the inner house. Now the cherubims were also made of wood. They were carved. And they stretched forth the wings of the cherubim so that the wing of the one touched the one wall and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. And he overlaid the cherubims with gold. We skip in again. Again, I invite you to read all. Verse 31. And the entering of the oracle, he made doors of olive tree. So to go to the Holy of Holies, the lintel and side post were fifth part of the wall. The two doors were also of olive tree and he carved upon them the carvings of the cherubim. So the cherubim themselves were carved, but even on the doors, remember, even on the doors and the walls, cherubim were carved. And palm trees and open flowers and overlaid them with gold and spread gold upon the cherubim and upon the palm trees. So also made he for the door of the temple post of olive tree, a fourth part of the wall, and the two doors were of fir tree. Remember all these we read before who is providing and helping in all of this, the cedar, the fir, and all the workmanship. The two leaves of the one door were folding and the two leaves of the other door were folding and he carved them on cherubims and palm trees and open flowers and covered them with gold fitted upon the carved work. So we're seeing here that the alliance that the king of the King Solomon had with the king of Hiram was not an ordinary alliance. It was not an ordinary alliance. King Hiram played, I never knew this before either, before this Bible study. So all this was new to me as well. King Hiram, the king of Tyre. And this, was, this has never been taught. So that's why we never know this, right? It's out there, but we've never taught this to say what we know this. But Tyre, had a very critical role in the building of the temple of Elohim. And I want to put this to you, that with all reverence and glory and honor to Elohim of the Shamaim of the heavens that deserves it, the building of his house is not like when you and I, without any disrespecting to anyone or offense to anyone, is not like when you and I go and get an architect to prepare a plan, to prepare the design, and get it approved by the Ministry of Planning, 
and then call this person up on the phone and he would be the foreman and he will get workers and he would come and he would survey the land and he would put the first post in the ground and dig the foundation and his workers will establish the foundation. Let me tell you something. The building of your house and my house or the government scheme that building, you know, um, the UK government um, said they're going to build how, much, how many millions of houses, right? Let me tell you compared no comparison to the building of the temple of elohim and the only way to grasp as we proceed in to break down ezekiel 28 and understanding step by step what is happening in the first of all from foundation that the tire the generation of tire crucial role in building the temple of Elohim is not a light thing, right? So now let us look at Solomon's alliance still in 1 Kings 7. And in 1 Kings 7, we're not going to read all as well. I'm skipping through, but I encourage you to read the entire scripture if you want to get the depth of what this means to Elohim. Forget ourselves. We have to surrender to Yahuwah. So, 1 Kings 7 verse 1 to 2, but Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished all his house. He built also, so 13 years, I thought it was 20. He built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. The length thereof, thereof was 100 cubits and the breadth thereof 50 cubits and the height thereof 30 cubits upon four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams upon the pillars. So, so 13 years, Solomon is finished building his own house here. And then we're going to jump through to verse 8. Again, I would love to read all. And his house where he dwelt had another court. So remember, the king of Tyre had an, uh, uh, an influential, a more than influential, but a direct is the correct word, a direct role in the building of the temple of Elohim. Okay? But he also had a direct role. Sorry, I can't say my hours. I have a lisp. In the building of solomon's house that's what we're seeing here now and his house where he dwelt had another court within the porch which was like which was of the like work solomon made also an house for pharaoh's daughter whom he had taken to wife like unto this porch all these were of costly stones according to the measure of huge stones sawed with saws within and without even from the foundation unto the coping and so on the outside towards the great court and the foundation was of costly stones, even great stones. This is the same thing we see for the temple of Elohim, costly stones and great stones, stones of 10 cubits and stones of eight cubits. And above were costly stones after the measure of huge stones and cedars. And the great court round about was with three rows of huge stones and a row of cedar beams, both for the inner court of the house of Yahuwah and for the porch of the house. So the great court round about had three rows of huge stones and cedar beams. For, so for Solomon's house, the court of the house of Yahuwah, and for the porch of Solomon's house, basically they use that same type of, um, how you call it, material. So now let's look at, we're going to look at a couple other, we're skipping through different verses. I invite you to read the full chapter. We're going to look at 13 to 14. And King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. Now, this is another Hiram. This was interesting to note. So the king of Tyre had somebody else who was by the name Hiram, right? He was a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali. And his father was a man of Tyre, a working in brass. And he was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work all works in brass. And he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. So all the work of brass, he, that, that the king of Tyre sent Hiram out of Tyre who was of the tribe of Naphtali, but his father was a man of Tyrus. Because you know, according to scripture, it's based on the father, then you okay, children of Israel down the line, that sort of thing. So that's why he's called a man of Tyre, because his father was from Tyre. So he was chosen to work all the different works of brass. And he was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work all works in brass. So now we're going to go down to verse 18. We're skipping. You can read all what he did right 
He made the pillars and two rows round about upon the one network to cover the chapters that were upon the top with pomegranates, and so did he for the other chapter. Then we're going down to verse 21. He set up the pillars in the porch of the temple. So he is doing the work in the temple. And he set up the right pillar and called the name there of Jakin. And he set up the left pillar and called the name there of Boaz. Now, this is something that the, the Freemasons, that's another discussion, has taken and twisted. And that's why the Freemasons use the pillar. And they have Hiram, what's the thing again? Hiram, Mac, what's he, Macbeth? I forget it, forget it. I don't need to know it. But this is something that the Freemasons have taken and twisted. So 27 to 29, you could see all his work. Saints, this is all the work he did in the temple. I can't go through all of it, but I'm picking out key things. So you could get the picture with depth of understanding. And we're going to go down to 27. So again, like I said, when you have time, read it and you will see the depth. You will get the depth. I had to study this all as well. And he made 10 brass bases of brass, 27 now to 29. Four cubits was the length of one base, four cubits the breadth thereof, and three cubits the height thereof. And the work of the bases was on this manner. They had borders, and the borders were between the ledges. And on the borders that were between the ledges were lions, oxen, cherubims. And upon the ledges, there was a base above, and beneath the lions and oxen were certain additions made of fin work. So we see that even the Hiram had a great role in the building of the temple and in the works of brass and in the, the, the pillars and the, the carvings of the lions and the oxen and the cherubims that can be found in the temple. Let's go down again with skipping. Again, you can read all this because it explains it all. Even here, 46. For on the plates of the ledges thereof and on the borders thereof, he grave cherubims, lions, and palm trees according to the proportion of everyone and additions round about. We're going down again. We're going down to 40. And, he made, and Hiram made the lavers and the shovels and the basins. So Hiram made an end. This, this verse, huh, this verse shook me. Because we who, once you have gone through the book of Exodus, and you've gone through the building of Elohim's tabernacle to understand his temple. Because remember, David wanted to build his temple with all his heart. And David was a man after Elohim's heart. So after reading this verse in 40, it cemented some things for me. And he made the lavas and the shovels and the basins. So he made an end of doing all the work that he made King Solomon for the house of Yahuwah. I don't know if you're beginning to see this. Just in understanding the generation of the king of Tyre. You see, the thing about it, scripture is that many times, sometimes, and even I am trying to learn not to do this, hence I'm sharing my Bible studies with you all. In the past, I would have done, take a scripture, read it. Yeah, this means so-and-so, this means so-and-so. But Elohim by his Holy Spirit has demonstrated. Elohim is deep. We cannot comprehend him. And it's always deeper than we just think. Hallelujah. So for Hiram to make an end of doing all the work on the house of Elohim, if that verse hasn't cemented things for you, then I would say go back and read about his tabernacle and those that build in his tabernacle and all the things Elohim said. And come back and read about building his second temple and read about when David wanted to build his second temple and what it meant to Elohim for David to just want to build a temple. Not even building it, but just want to build it. What that meant to Yahuwah. So, and four pomegranates. So he finished all the work that he worked for the house of Elohim. The two pillars, and he's given more because this is an addition to all that's listed. So he's continuing. The two bowls of the chapters that were on top of the two pillars, the two networks to cover the two bowls of the chapters, which were on, pop, which, sorry, pop on the top of the pillars. 400 pomegranates for the two networks. That's a lot of work. Even two rows of pomegranates for one network. To cover, to cover the two bowls of the chapter that were upon the pillars and the 10 bases and 10 lavas of the bases and one sea and 12 oxen under the sea and the pots and the shovels and the basins. That's in addition to even the cherubims and the lions and oxen that he carved. Remember? All the different cherubims carving. In addition, and the pots and the shovels and even the basins, saints. 
even the basins and all these vessels which he were made to King Solomon for the house of Yahuwah were bright brass. Hallelujah. You can read that rest of chapter. So this rejoices your heart because the building of temple of the temple of Yahuwah, like I said, is nothing like building our house. You have to have special favor, <laughs> special anointing, special, the same French auction, special favor to even touch something that is in regard to the building of Elohim's temple. And I want you and I to put that in our spirit. Right now, we're forgetting everything we've ever learned because that's where cognitive dissonance will come and will block us from actually seeing what is the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, trying to reveal to us now. We want to understand scripture. Do we want to confirm what we always believe or just sometimes you understand scripture and it confirms it. And sometimes when you understand the scripture, it rejects it, what we thought we had known. So after the house was built, all of Yahshua assembled. I want us to, I'm taking you through. We're almost there. So after the house was built, all of Yahshua assembled since. Hiram, Tyra, the king of Tyra, Hiram whom he sent of Tyra, and of course the other men. Remember Tyra sent other men. This was a large thing. Remember they had over 3,000, um, four men. So this was a large thing going on. But it was an alliance in particular. Not just with anyone. The building of the temple of Elohim was not an alliance between Solomon and, and Assyria and Babylon and this one and this one. In particular, we're establishing this. The alliance is with the king of Tyre. And Tyre, the work that they have done for all the work of the house of Elohim, even the pots, the shovels and the basins the carving of the cherubims, even the holy of holies, the sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant is placed. I'm ready to jump out of my seat. I'm trying to contain myself. So now what we're going to do, we're going to skip some more verses in 1 Kings 8. Because now I want us to understand, now that the temple has been built through this alliance that was formed, right? Tyra was chosen. What happened? We're not going to read the whole chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. <clears throat> but it's important to understand what happens when this temple was built. And many of you know this, but now you're knowing this with a different, with a deeper understanding because now you're understanding what was behind this when this happened, when we've all heard about it before. And we're going to skip some verses and we're just going to look at verse 1 Kings 8, right? 1 to 14. Then Solomon assembled the elders. Of, so Solomon is assembling the elders of Israel, the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children. All of Jerusalem is gathered. Now the temple was magnificent. Magnificent. This was hard work. 13 years of hard work between Solomon, Israel, and Tyre. Israel and Tyre had to have a beautiful alliance and friendship for to maintain such peaceful transactions and alliance throughout that time to see the beginning of the building of the temple when they laid the foundations. Remember it said Hiram's involvement in laying the foundations to the end when all the work was done. Think of this. That was not because of man. Because for man alone, you know, even us as, as, as human beings, we might say something and it offends somebody and we are sorry or I really hope I didn't offend you or we try our best not to offend or whatever the case may be. But for them to have that kind of alliance for the building of the temple of Elohim is not for man. If we understand Yahuwah, we would understand that statement. Let me continue. So all of them have gathered, right? And it was the feast of the tabernacles at that time. The interesting thing, and Yahuwah is timely. Everything that happens, oh my goodness, since Yahuwah, Yahuwah, he has appointed times. When Yahusha resurrected from the dead, he resurrected at the time of the first fruits, which is one of Yahuwah's feasts, right? When the, the, the disciples received the, the, um, the anointing, right? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
it was at the time of Shavuot, which is 50 days after first fruits, which is why it's called Pentecost. Pentecost is the Greek word for 50. I'm saying all this for you to see. Yahuwah is timely. He does things at set times. Set times. Yahusha died. When did he die? He died at the time of, he was the Passover lamb. He had the Passover meal. And during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, get all the leaven out of your house, right? Yahuwah was, Yahusha, sorry, was in the grave. So all this is happening with, along with Yahuwah's feast. It's amazing. So this time the temple, it so happened that with the building of the temple and it's finished, it's at the time of the Feast of the Tabernacles. All right? And they are gathered. So I'm going to skip. But let us read from four. And they brought up the ark of Yahuwah and the tabernacle of the congregation. I want you to think of the importance of the ark of Yahuwah. Think of what happened when somebody just touched the ark. You know, when they thought that the ark was going to fall and he just put out his hand to touch the ark, Elohim smote him dead. That is why I'm, I'm encouraging you to try to see this through the eyes of the spirit. See this through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and understanding will come. I'm not saying you don't have understanding. These are the same things I said to myself. So we've seen here. They, so they brought up the Ark of Elohim and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those that the priests and the Levites bring up and King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him and I believe even David, there were some more vessels because remember, even David had vessels and stuff he had put aside for the tabernacle. So, and King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark. Now, let's see what happened after the temple is built. All this is important to understand Ezekiel 28, and you're going to see why. It's not about just reading a verse, mm, it means this. Yahuwah is deep. We're going to see why. So, they sacrificed sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priests, because it's not all I'm reading, and the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of Elohim unto the, his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims, which Tyra assisted in carving and building. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves at the end of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle. And they were not seen without. And, they, and there they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark, which we know from the time of Moses, save the two tables of stone, which Moses put in there at Horeb. Remember, it was the Ten Commandments. And remember now, according to Hebrews chapter 8, the law is written on our hearts. It's no longer in the tables of the on the tables of stone, but it's written on our heart by the Holy Spirit. So, but nonetheless, let's focus on this. The ark had the two tables of stone, which Moses put there in Horeb. When Yahuwah, so you know what preciousness, and that's my own word. <laughs> you know this precious thing that is there right now in the house, in the most holy place, the ark of the covenant with the table of stones that Moses put in there. That Elohim wrote with his finger. Ponder on that. When they came out of the land, when Yahuwah made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, we end on 12, when the priests will come out of the holy place. What happened? The cloud filled the house of Yahuwah so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of Yahuwah had filled the house of Yahuwah. Ponder on that. Sila. From all those who've read about Moses and in the time of Exodus, when the cloud of Yahuwah came, huh, we know this is important. This is not something to downplay. This is serious. Elohim is serious. He's a righteous Elohim. We're going to jump down to verse 18. I'm inviting you to read the, all, the whole chapter when you have time. And Yahuwah said unto David, my father. So Solomon prayed. We all know of Solomon's prayer. And it's a beautiful prayer. You can go through it. It's really, really long. I read it, but I can't share it all tonight. So we're just taking some excerpts. 
Whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. Remember I said this, what it meant for Elohim, just for him to have in his heart that he wants to build his house. And that's why we have to be careful what's in our heart. Look at these evil blasphemous kings just in their heart, to think these things in their heart. So David had in his heart, it was a valuable and precious thing in his heart, a strong desire to build a house for Yahuwah. And Solomon is praying and reminding Elohim of this. Nevertheless, I don't think I have to read 19. You can read that another time. 21. And I have set their place for the ark, wherein is the covenant of Yahuwah, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. 27. But will Elohim indeed dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. And that is why I say submit to truth. Submit to his word. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. It's a fact. It's a fact. We cannot comprehend him. He gives us a measure of understanding. Hallelujah. We thank him for that. How much less this house that I have built. And even if it's less, as he's saying here, it was still a precious thing to Yahuwah. And we're reading unto 29. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplications, O Adonai Yahuwah, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be opened towards this house, house night and day. This is not like, and I'm not saying this in disrespect, all right? But this is not like the Catholic church down the road. This is not like, and I'm not saying this in disrespect, the Baptist, Baptist church around the corner, and I'm not picking on anything, but I'm just saying this so we can understand. This is the house, the house of Elohim that he has chosen to put his name there. He has chosen that his glory will abide in that house, right? At this time, we're looking at the history of the time of Solomon. So I'm reading what I'm reading now. So, thine eyes may be open towards this house night and day, even towards the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make towards this place. Now we're going to jump down. It's beautiful, this prayer. And I'm just going to jump down to just a couple verses, three verses only. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give ruin upon the land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. And then we're going down to 40. So that they may fare thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. And 45. Then hear thou in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. So Solomon is praying that Elohim will always have his eyes upon the house that was just built. Day and night. When we read verse 56, that's why I said it's a long chapter. You can read it on your own. It tells you, I don't know if it says it here, because um, 65 or 65. So verse 65 says, and at that time Solomon held the feast and all Israel with him in a great congregation from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. So all Israel was gathered before Adonai who was seven days and seven days, even 14 days on the eighth day. He sent the people away and they blessed the king and went unto their tents joyfully and glad of, of heart for all the goodness that Adonai had done for David his servant and Israel for all his people. So when you read the chapter, you'll see it was the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, so Elohim, now Solomon has prayed, the glory of Yahuwah has descended, right? The glory of Yahuwah has descended and the priest could not even continue because of the cloud that filled the temple. And then Solomon has prayed, right? And Elohim, we're not going to read all 1 Kings 9. You can read all another time, but we're only going to read from 1 to 9. Elohim has answered his prayer. And it, and it, it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of Adonai and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do, that Yahuwah appeared to Solomon the second time as he appeared unto him at Gibeon. Remember the first time is when he asked for wisdom. And Yahuwah said unto him, I have heard thy prayer 
and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. When Yahuwah says perpetually, and he put his name there on that house forever, this is, a, this is not a light thing. I hope you are really seeing this, I pray, through the eyes of the Ruach HaKodesh. We cannot study this scripture from our fleshly mind. We cannot study this flip scripture with what I think, what I believe it's so and so. We have to study to see what scripture is saying to us. Scripture is revealed. There's a verse, I think it's Timothy that says, I'm not sure. No scripture is private or personal interpretation. It is revealed. The truth is revealed. And we have to see it from the eyes of the spirit. So when Yahuwah answers Solomon's prayer, that he prayed in that very temple, and he is answering him in that very place, and he says, he has hallowed that house. It's holy. It's sanctified, which you have built. And he has put his name there forever. And his eyes and his heart, Yahuwah's heart and eyes shall be there perpetually. And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever. As I promised to David thy father saying, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. But if he shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other Elohim and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land, which I have given them. And we know this is even from Deuteronomy, okay? And this house, which I have hallowed, the house is hallowed by Yahuwah. That is not a light thing. For my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. And at this house, which is high, everyone that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss. And they shall say, why have the Adonai done this unto the land and to his house? And they shall answer, because they forsook Adonai Yahuwah, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have taken hold upon other gods and have worshipped them and served them. Therefore have Adonai brought upon them all this evil. So if Solomon and his generation do not continue in the right way, according to scripture, worshiping Yahuwah only, they will become a byword, we see here. They will become a proverb, and they will be cut out of the land. We're only going to read one scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 37. It says, it's the curses. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword, among all nations, whither Yahuwah shall lead thee. You see, scripture aligns with scripture saints. This is what I'm taking you through tonight. And you may have to go back on your own and take your time and go through this to get, you know, go through, because I had to read all the chapters as well. Scripture aligns with scripture. And that's how you know it's not of your private interpretation. Hallelujah. We're coming down. We're almost there. Solomon gave Hiram. So now we have, Solomon has prayed. Yahuwah has answered his prayer. He has hallowed that place. Think of that. That place is hallowed. And now this, oh, I think there's a moth inside because my windows are wide open. It's extremely hot today, unbearable. We're just going to look at a couple verses again. Again, I invite you to read the whole chapter. Only verse 10 to 12. Now, Solomon and Hiram still have that alliance. And you're reading verse 10 to 12, because of all that Hiram did, I want you to understand the involvement that they had in the temple. So Solomon did something here, and it came to pass at the end of 20 years. So this is where I saw the 20 years when I had it in my, in my mind. When Solomon had built the two houses, the house of Yahuwah and the king's house. So actually at the end of 20 years. So I was right. Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold, according to all his desire, that, that then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. So we know that Hiram furnished Solomon with everything he needed for the house. 
the cedar trees, the fir trees, the gold, and also played a part in all the carvings of the lions and the and the oxes and the cherubims, you know, and the pillars and and the, the vessels and the basins and the you know and the chapters and it goes on and on and on and on and on. When you read in Kings, you will see the amount of work that was done. We're going down to verse 27. Again, I invite you to read the whole chapter. 27 to 28. So Solomon gave him some cities, 20 cities, right? It's um, like a reward, you know? But Hiram didn't like these cities. And Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had give him, given him. And they pleased him not. And he said, what cities are thee which thou hast given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul unto this day. Right, I should have to look into the sefer to see what Kabul name means because I love the sefer when the sefer gives you the meaning of all these things. So, take it, um, Hiram did not like the cities that Solomon gave him, right? So, that's where a contention, a little contention, has started. But nonetheless, let's continue. Verse 27, you could read about that contention in that chapter. So, verse 27 now to 28 only, and Hiram sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea, with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir and fetched from thence gold, 420 talents, and brought it to, to King Solomon. So again, Hiram is still, even after the end of the building of the temple and the house of Elohim and, and Solomon's house, he is still in this alliance doing a trade, doing trade with Israel and bringing gold and Sida and whatever else Solomon needs, right? Now I want us to look at 14 to 27. I was supposed to read 14. What's 14? So you can read it another time. So it talks about the Hiram sent to the king six score talents of gold. So as you can see, Hiram of Tyre is super rich. He is super, super, super rich. And you can read all this, you know, to get uh, some more understanding about the storehouses, you know, and that trade. You see, there was a trade between Solomon and Tyra, a constant, constant trade, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to look, the Queen of Sheba has visited, and we're almost ending with the Book of Kings. And after the Queen of Sheba visited, we know this story, but even when the Queen of Sheba, Sheba has visited, even at that time, we have the king of Hiram us again here again. And we read in 1 Kings 10, 11 to 12. And the navy, all these are on my slide. So don't worry, when you get the presentation, I'll put back the slide up. You can pause it. These are also written on the slide so you could do your Bible study. And all and the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophi. Remember, we saw that gold from Ophi in chapter 9, right? Brought in from Ophi great plenty of almog trees and precious stones. So Hiram went wherever he went, wherever he traded to get something that is called Almog trees. And listen to this. And the king made of the Almog trees pillars of the house of Yahuwah and for the king's house. So he's still building. You know, Solomon still put up something. That is precious, this Almog tree. So he still put up something precious in the house of Yahuwah, which who gave it? The king of Tyre. Hiram, the king of Tyre, gave it to him. Harps also and soldiers for, the, for singers. There came, listen, no such almog trees, nor was seen unto this day. So that was something precious, precious, precious. Hallelujah. So I'm seeing Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth is saying, yes, Satan woman's planet to plan the occult studies to the occult studies to try to know Satan trade roots. <laughs> Leave them in it. I know. He goes up and down the earth, roaming up and about in it. You're sure right. All the names of Elohim are the meaning. He's the way. The different names are the names of Elohim given to the chosen group. This, this group are a piece of his church from start to end. Amen. That's right. He has many names, you know, and we can probably do another video on that another time. So now we're looking at a new king of Tyre. So now, remember, we are this, this study, we're coming to the close of this part. In order to understand the book of Ezekiel, we established first, according to scripture, that it was not um, Hasatan, right? And we show, according to scripture, what is Satan's end. So the anointed cherub 
is not Satan. Regardless of what we want to think we believe, the scripture says something different. Then the second thing we establish, so if it's not Satan, what is happening in Ezekiel 28? And that's when Elohim revealed to me, first I need to study the generation of the Tyrian kings. So now we're coming to a close of this part. And a new king is on the scene. And we're going to skip a couple chapters to verse 16. And we're only going to read, I think it's three verses. And in those three verses, verse, first Kings chapter 16, this is down, I think, seven generations. And after Hiram. And we have another king on this scene. And his name is Ethbal. And he's the new king of Tyre. We're reading from 29. You can read that whole chapter another time. And in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did, did evil in the sight of Yahuwah above all that were before him. He was bad. And we know his story. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, remember when the kingdom was rent in two and it was given to the servant and the evil he did? So imagine the evil he did, right? It was a light thing for King Ahab. That's how wicked he was and evil. That he took, listen to this, he took the wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, which is Sidon, and went and served B-A-A-L and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for B-A-A-L in the house of B-A-A-L, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke Adonai, Yahuwah of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Right? So we see here, these are the scriptures which you will be able to pause to understand the generation of the king, the Tyrian kings, Tyrian kings that we've gone through, the alliance with David and the alliance with Solomon. And what we're going to see here now is, I think we covered this one. This is what we just covered. So I'm just moving the slide. For those of you who will be looking this over to pause, so you can pause this as well here, right? The important thing, role that the king of Tyre played in building the temple of Elohim. So as we're coming down to a close, um, Elohim has put it in my spirit that we have to understand this. And we all know about, in order to understand how important this is, and I'm sure I have attested to this as we were expounding on the scripture. So I don't need to go into great detail now. But Exodus chapter 31 tells us, when you're reading Exodus chapter 31, it tells us that Yahuwah spoke unto Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of Elohim in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass. Do you see the parallel with Hiram? Remember it said he was cunning in all works of brass and he had wisdom and all understanding in the cunning works. This is, you see the parallel. Elohim has put his spirit in Bezalel and in cutting stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of, where do I end? Let me just see where I end because I know it's not all I need to read. Right, the son, right. And I have given him the son of ah Aholiab, the son of Ahishamak, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. So we're seeing here. Thank you, Babe Ruth. I'll have to look at it after because I'm trying to, I'll look at it after, but I, I don't want to lose my, my thought here. So we're seeing here that Elohim has put, right, the his spirit on Bezalel and a holy ab to build his house and all those that will be involved in the building of his house the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle and the table and its furniture 
and the pure candlestick with all his furniture, and the altar of all incense, and the altar of burnt offering with his furniture, and the lava and his foot, and the cloths of service, and his holy garments for Ahab and the priest, and garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office, and the anointed oil, and we end here, and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, they shall do. Who put it in them seeds? Who has given these men Bezalel and Aholiab and anybody else involved? He said, and all they that are wise hearted, I have put wisdom. Elohim, Yahuwah has done this. It is not by man's own talent. It is not by how great man is. Because this is not the building of your house and my house with all due respect. This is the building of Elohim's house. Most holy, highest in all power. No power above him. This is his house. 36 verse 1 to 2. Then what Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whom Yahuwah put wisdom and understanding to know what? How to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary according to all that the uh, Yahuwah had commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Oholiab and every wise-hearted man in, in, in whose heart, in whose heart, I repeat, Yahuwah had put wisdom, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. So we're establishing here we almost through with this section. We have one more scripture for this section. One more section. I'm Zerubbabel. We are establishing here that anyone who worked on Yahuwah's house in the building of the tabernacle did not do it because they were mighty, great talent, intelligent, intellects, skilled. Yahuwah has given them wisdom, understanding, and skill to do all the works according to his command hallelujah no that was the building of the tabernacle now i want us to see here in first chronicles you're going through my bible study with me hallelujah chapter 28 verse 9 to 12 just a few verses as well what it means so we see here the tabernacle in the time of moses i want us to go back and just for a brief second See when Solomon was chosen to do all that we've just read now, and Yahuwah's glory appeared in the cloud in that temple. And we read in First Chronicles 28, 9, verse 9 to 12. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou Elohim of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for Yahuwah searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for Yahuwah have chosen you, Solomon, to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Do you know what it means to get a command from Yahuwah? What Yahusha said when he walked upon this earth, the son of Elohim, the commands of his father, he hears that he does. Think of what it means to get a command from Yahuwah. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof. Now we've just read all of this. We, we had to skip to the verses, but you get the, the, the gist of it. And the, of the upper chambers thereof and the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit, the spirit of Elohim of the courts of the house of Yahuwah and of all the chambers round about and all the treasures of the house of Yahuwah and of the treasures of the dedicated things. And when you read the rest of this chapter, it tells you the pattern for all the dedicated things. And that is why these men, the alliance with Tyra in the building of the temple of Elohim was not a simple alliance that we can just push under the rock. You cannot push it under the rock. Now, I want to talk about one more thing before I close this next section. And the one more thing I want to talk about is when Solomon's temple was destroyed, and we know that his temple was destroyed because of his disobedience, 
and the disobedience of many others, Manasseh and King Ahab and all those down the line. We know the story. We're not going into all of it now. But what I want us to understand is the temple of Elohim saints is important. And even if now we are the temple of Elohim through Yahusha HaMashiach, it does not downplay what we're reading in scripture. And we must have that understanding because the problem, and I'm saying this with all due respect, and I'm saying it from my being taught in the Christian community, is that because we have Yahusha, they just throw everything out in the scripture and don't realize the whole scripture is important. The book from the start of the very first word and in the beginning, Elohim created to the very last word in, in Revelations. Behold, I come quickly. I don't know what the last word is. But from the very last word, it's scripture. And studying his word is what will help you to understand Elohim. Is what will help us to walk in truth because his word is truth. And not because our bodies are the temple of the Ruach HaKadosh, that we should minimize the understanding and the revelation that goes with the building of Elohim's temple, his tabernacle, time of Moses, his temple, hallelujah, in the time of Solomon. And then the temple was destroyed, but then the temple had to be rebuilt. So it was still important. It was still important for that temple now to be rebuilt. And we're not going to look at all. I invite you to read Zechariah, beautiful book. And also the book of Ezra. For those of you who have the Sefer, because they took out some of the books of Ezra from the KJV. So you have 1st Ezra, 2nd Ezra, 3rd Ezra, 4 Ezra in the Sefer, hallelujah, the restored scriptures that gives you a lot of detail about the time of that second temple. But we won't cover that today. We're only going to cover, again, Elohim anointed. And what we're establishing here is that the important role that the king of Tyre played in the building of the temple of Elohim. That we understand the anointing that was on Bezalin and Hodiab, right? We understand the anointing that was upon Solomon when he said to, he has been chosen to build the temple of Elohim and do it. And now we're going to understand Zerubbabel and Joshua. So Zerubbabel and Joshua, we know, was chosen to build, rebuild the second temple. So now we hear in, Ze in Zechariah chapter 4, and I'm just going to skip through this, right? So we have before us a candlestick of all gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes of the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. You see, picture this imagery. It's important to understand the imagery. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side of the bowl. And so I answered and spoke to the angel that talked with me. What are these, my Lord? Then the angel said, the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, Adonai. And he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of Yahuwah unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahuwah Sevaut. So, so Zerubbabel, who is chosen to rebuild the temple of Elohim, this confirms what I've been telling you all along. It's not because of skill. It's not because of intelligence. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. It is only by the spirit of Elohim. Anyone involved in his temple can work the works, to do the works to perfection. And that is another important thing. The works can be done. You know, we, had, we were redoing the ceilings in our room. And the men came and we had to all be sleeping downstairs because they were doing the ceilings upstairs and it was a mess. And there was a time when the work was done and the foreman came and we had to, they had to come back because it wasn't done properly. When you look at the edges, they had to come back. That was not allowed in the temple of Elohim. Elohim wouldn't have men doing that. So these men cannot do it by their might. These men cannot do it by their intelligence. Elohim has put his wisdom he has put his spirit for them to do the work to perfection. I want you to ponder on that word. Perfection. I'm sure you agree with me. Type yes if you agree with me. So we're almost through with here, here. So, and the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. 
and thou shalt know that Yahuwah Sevaud have sent me unto you. And when you go down, you read that he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by Yahuwah of the whole earth. The two anointed ones are Zerubbabel, right? And Joshua. These are the two anointed ones that were chosen. And you read about Joshua, I think, in Zechariah chapter 3, that were chosen to stand before Elohim. So when they say the two anointed ones, the two olive and I think it's the olive trees on one on one side and the other on the, on the left, it's important to see the symbolism as well. The symbolism that is that, that is used here. And I'm going to prove to you because you know I like to prove it through scripture by only reading two verses. And I'm going to prove to you that what we've read in Ezra is true. So we're reading first Ezra 2 and we're going to prove what we've read in Ezra is true. And then we close off this section. Right? So first Ezra. Now, these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity. Remember, coming out of the Babylonian captivity. Sorry, I thought it was there. Of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel, had carried away unto Babel, and came again unto Jerusalem, which is Jerusalem, and Yehuda, Judah, everyone unto his city, which came with Zerubbabel, and Yeshua, that's Joshua, Nekem Yahu, Serah Yahu, Reel La Ya. Mordecai, Bilshan, Mikpah, Bigvai, Rekom, Ba'ana, the number of the men of the people of Yasharel. And it goes down and it starts to give you the children, 900,000, 703 score, and it gives you all those who came up out of it. So that was the time when they returned from Babylonian captivity. So as we close off this side here, one section, one, se set, one minute, sorry. Um, let me get my slides up. So we close off this section here, and I'm sure you would have appreciated and understand that it's not a light thing for Hiram and Hiram, the king of Tyre, that wrought the work, all the work we saw in the scripture, not my words. It says all the work in the house of Elohim, even in the Holy of Holies, that that was not something to downplay. And the Hiram, <clears throat> king of Tyre, I don't think that they understood the prestige and honor that was accorded to them, the anointing that they received from Yahuwah. And how we know that they receive anointing? Because scripture always confirms scripture. He did it for Bezalil and Ohialab. He did it for Solomon to build his house. He did it for Zerubbabel and Joshua. So we know that anybody, because we see Yahuwah, you can see his pattern. And we know because he has done that, and he has explained and he has demonstrated the importance of building his temple that he would anoint whoever and all the people whose hand shall touch any vessel to work the works in his house to perfection. Thank you. 